Well, it's a great pleasure to welcome Pascal Selenart to the JQR seminar. She actually gave us seminar in 2012, the JQI. It wasn't virtual, obviously. And uh, we stay in touch quite a bit and she knows a lot about what's going on here, the JQI. So she is a research director at CNRS and she is associate professor at Polytechnique, a university in France. Uh, if you don't know, CNRS is a French National Center for Scientific Research. It's a distribution of labs all through France. And she is at the Center for Nanoscience and Nanotechnology. It's called C2N. It's a new research place that just opened up a few years ago. Maybe she'll have something to say about it. She has a very lively and dynamic group. At least that's the way I've always seen it. And uh, they seem to do, be doing quite well during the pandemic, at least from their recent publications. And she's also the co-founder of a company called Quandela, which makes single photon sources and uh, it's a startup company. And I think they have roughly 20 people. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Pascal. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you, Alicia and Charles for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be with you all today. Uh, it's true, it's been nine years since I came to Washington DC for the first time for my first TQI seminar. I had a wonderful time back then and uh, uh, I'm happy to be with you today. Uh, also, although I hope at some point we'll be able to meet again in real life. So like Glenn said, uh, I work at the Center for Nanoscience and Nanotechnology. It's a joint CNRS University Paris Saclay uh, laboratory, and it's a brand new building. You can see pictures here uh, of this beautiful building. We moved into this new building at the end of 2018. And it's one of, um, so it's a big lab where we have uh, around 400 people working in uh, semiconductor physics, basically with a very large clean room facility, 3,000 square meters, one of the biggest clean room in France, academic clean room in France. And you probably know that when you move such a big clean room, you are out of technology for a while. So we were ready to reopen the clean room around February last year. <laughs> so we shut down the lab and we were finally able to go back to the clean room and start the machines again in September. So we are back on track doing new technological development, I would say since just before Christmas. And we are very glad about it. So it means that all the story I will tell you today um, has been done with devices fabricated before that time. And we have not been able to do new technological developments since then. So in my group, we work on semiconductor devices. And our objective is to study cavity quantum electrodynamics with semiconductor quantum dots and to generate and manipulate quantum light. And today I will just discuss generation of quantum light in our system. So, um, so few motivations first, nothing very special. I will just to mention why uh, we work in this field, some motivation about uh, the, the, the key uh, place that light takes in quantum technologies. So uh, what I like very much about light in this um, broad field of quantum technology is that you have many flavors of quantum light. You can work with discrete variable where you basically work with single photons, for instance, or you can use continuous variable where you are interested in the wave a dimension of light and you can play with the quadrature of the field. And there are also many degrees of freedom you can use to encode the information. You can use path, polarization, orbital angular momentum, time, energy, photon number, etc. Of course, light is uh, foreseen as very important for quantum communications. And first, emblematic application is quantum key distribution. But in fact, uh, it's been shown that you don't really need quantum light to do quantum key distribution, at least for a short distance. You can do it with attenuated lasers using decoy state. But you can also use continuous variable, which may be also sometimes be less demanding on the resource, the quantum light uh, source. But if you want to go to long distances or high rates, maybe you will need at some point to have efficient single photon sources. Which brings me to the next application. Obviously, at some point, we would like to see if we are able to share entanglement on long distances and build what we call quantum networks. And there are more and more architectures that are envisioned for that. And I just sketch here two big types of uh, quantum network architecture, some based on memories where you can have 
quantum memories and uh, quantum like mostly single photon used to link the quantum memories or the other types of uh, quantum repeaters approach, which is based on measurement, where this time you, you remove the memory, the need for memory, but you put a lot of um, requests on the quantum light source, could be made of many untangled photons with highly redundant entanglement so that you can implement uh, some kind of quantum repeater schemes. Last but not least, uh, light has uh, been has long been a platform for optical quantum computing. I think one of the main motivation in the beginning was that photons are non-interacting particles in a transparent medium, so they don't suffer from decoherence. If you think of discrete variable, it's very easy to make single 3D gates. Uh, you just use a wave plate if you want to manipulate polarization, for instance. You can do the computation, not everything, but uh, at least the computation can be done at room temperature on chip. And it's a platform that is naturally connected to a network. So it, you can be, you can think at some point that it could be easy to do easy, so, so to speak, uh, to do distributed quantum computing. It's a natural platform for that. Of course, the big challenge is obvious. It's to have photon photon gates if you don't have interacting particles. But there are different ways of dealing with that. So in the NISC, area uh, when you want to manipulate just a few dozens of qubits, linear quantum computing may still be uh, interesting using just the quantum interference of uh, indistinguishable photons to uh, um, implement probabilistic gates. To go beyond that, there are many ideas. You can work on nonlinear optical quantum computing. So there are many works where you can exploit, develop nonlinearities at a single photon scale, like these pin photon interfaces that were developed, for instance, in the group of EDUAX here in the University of Maryland. And also in the longer term, you have the idea that you can use, you can mix gates and uh, small cluster states of light to do measurement-based quantum computing. And these are, of course, uh, very promising avenues to scale up all that. So if you look at the private, uh, part of the community. Uh, we have also seen a, a lot of momentum in this optical quantum computing with uh, the creation of PsyQuantum in 2018, 16, sorry, Xanadu in 2018, and both companies are doing quite well, at, at least if you follow what, uh, how, many, how much money they've raised, hundreds of millions each. In Europe, we, uh, we have a different venture structure uh, so venture capital are not the same as in North America, but we have small scale, uh, smaller companies that are now developing the quantum computer there as well. QX from the Netherlands, uh, based on silicon nitride uh, chips, and Orca uh, in the UK, uh, a spin-off from uh, Ian Wormsley's group, uh, where they are trying to build a memory-based quantum computing. And all this, of course, has also gained some momentum with this recent publication from the group of Zhang Weipan in China, where they could demonstrate com quantum computational advantage using photons, using this Gaussian boson sorry Gaussian boson sampling scheme, which can be seen something like in between discrete variable and continuous variable, and uh, which is, I think, actually quite impressive. So. The, the first thing I want to dis discuss is how difficult it's it is to generate quantum light. And uh, from now on, I will discuss only discrete variables. So in principle, we would like uh, an ideal single photon source that would emit single photons uh, at each pulse. Each pulse would embed just one photon, no more, no less, and in a pure quantum state. The pure quantum, I'm oh, sorry. Um, of course, in real life, we will never have 100% probability to have a photon. So we introduce a metric, which is the probability to have exactly one photon per pulse. And we call that the brightness, but you can see it as a source efficiency. It allows to compare different technologies. We need the photon to be in a pure quantum state because for many applications, we still need indistinguishable photons so that can undergo this uh, hunger mandel interference, where you have two photons impinging on the beam splitter that exit together, the two other possibilities cancelling out because of quantum interference. There are basically two main technologies to fabricate a quantum light source like this. One based on frequency conversion that has actually driven the field for the last 20 years. And another technology based on single emitters that has been developed uh, in parallel. And I think it has just recently entered uh, the, 
the time where it can really uh, bring new applications. So just a few words, and you all know that, I just want to put things in perspective here. Uh, to generate uh, a single photons with a frequency conversion scheme, you send a laser on the nonlinear crystal and you generate photon pairs. You operate all that at low pump power. So the state you generate is mostly vacuum, sometimes one pair, sometimes two pairs. So in terms of efficiency, this source is quite, uh, has a low efficiency. I mean, the probability to have a pair is eta square. This is not a single photon source, but you can get a single photon source by using one of the photon here, you detect one of the photon to announce the presence of the other photon on the other side. When you do that, you just remove the vacuum part of the state here, and you end up with the signal part, which is very close to a single photon state. There is just a tiny bit of probability of having a, another photon, two photons here. So this is, um, nice because you have a heralding event which tells you that you have a photon. The difficulty is that you have this error, the fact that sometimes you have two photons, which actually is quantified by the G2, which is basically strict, strictly proportional to the efficiency of the source itself. So these kind of sources have many advantages. There are room temperatures, they have high, they can uh, be used to implement encoding in many degrees of freedom, high dimensionality, etc. The intrinsic limitation is the brightness is somehow related to the error rate. So if you want to have a very low error rate, you need to work with a source which is very inefficient. So there are ways around that. And uh, basically it's based on multiplexing. And I want to mention this beautiful work done by Paul Quiet uh, two years ago, where you just use one source and you have sometimes a photon that is fired and you stock it, you store it until you have all the photons you need to do your computation, for instance. That's one way of doing it. It's temporal uh, multiplexing. The other time, is, the other scheme is based on fabricating millions of sources and having them, each of them have a very low probability of firing a photon, but then you have a router because you know where the photon has been fired and you can route the photon to, to work the proper input of your quantum computational chip, for instance. And this is what has been adopted by PsyQuantum, for instance. So that's one way of doing it. And the other way is to use what is a natural single photon source in nature. It's a single atom. And we've been doing that for 30, 40 years now. If you shine a, a laser on a two level system, it can only scatter one photon at a time. So this is attractive, it's not enough. Actually what we need is more than that. It's an atom that we could call a 1D atom that emits a photon always in one well-defined mode of the electromagnetic field. So there are many ways to do that. So basically you take an a natural or an artificial atom and you put this atom in a photonic structure to control its spontaneous emission. And this kind of approach has been developed in many systems. I'm just making a, a, a small list here of some systems that are explored, quantum dot, defects in diamond, carbon in that, uh, defects in carbon nanotube, 2D materials, rare earth, um, ex, uh, molecules, etc. And uh, here at, uh, at JQR, you have a very important people working on that. So Glenn, obviously, uh, Kartrick and uh, Ido. So I'm gonna discuss this kind of system that you know very well, so I'm not gonna go into many details. So we work with semiconductor quantum dots and we fabricate these atom photon interfaces to make efficient quantum light sources. And in the next few slides, I will just summarize the key um, progress, the key ingredients that made our system work better and better over time. So we work with indium gallium arsenide quantum dot in gallium arsenide, and we, uh, did, which have been shown to emit single photons in 2000. And we insert them in the micropillar cavity. So you have two bright mirrors on top and bottom, and you etch uh, to make a cylinder of few microns in width, and you end up with a 3D cavity for your quantum dot. And with that, you implement cavity quantum electrodynamics, and we exploit the weak coupling regime. We work in the bad cavity limit where we just accelerate the spontaneous emission of the emitter into the cavity mode. And by doing that, we accelerate the spontaneous emission by the personal factor FP. And then the quantum dot has a probability of emitting into the mode, which is roughly FP divided by FP plus one. So that's, what, that's the first ingredient. The second ingredient that we are working on is the outcoupling efficiency. Once the quantum dot has emitted a photon into the cavity, the photon needs to exit the cavity through the proper output. And this is what we call a output coupling efficiency. 
So in 2008, we developed a technology that allowed us to precisely position the quantum dot inside an optical microcavity that is spectrally resonant to the quantum dot transition. And by doing that, we managed to have in 2013 quite bright sources of single photons. We, we were able to collect a single photon 80% of the time in the first lens after the, the device here. It was, it was a good uh, result back then, but still we had some difficulties in distinguishability. The quantum purity of our state was not, uh, not very good and at least was not reproducible. So to do that, we had to work a lot to reduce all kinds of noise around our emitter. So this is what we've done afterwards. We have changed a little bit of devices. So the quantum dot is still here. We have now the micro pillar, but we keep, we don't edge all around and we keep some rigid uh, structure around it to be able to make an electrical contact. And this is done to uh, be able to control the electronic environment, environment around the quantum dot. So basically we include the quantum dot in the diode structure and by applying a bias, we can have the, um, the charge around it swept away and we can reduce tremendously the charge noise. Second ingredient is to change the way we excite our system. So it seems quite obvious to people doing atomic physics, but for quantum dot people, it was more demanding when you work on this kind of micron sized devices. We implemented coherent control uh, so that we fully control the way we bring our system to the excited state before it emits a photon. So this is a typical uh, Rabi oscillation curve uh, where you see oscillation which are damped by spontaneous emission. And basically uh, we could show that we only need typically 10 photons on average to excite the quantum, to put the quantum dot into its excited state. The last thing we realized um, working on this is that we can, when we use cavity quantum electrodynamics, we strongly reduce phonon decoherence. And the idea is that uh, we put the quantum dot in resonance with the cavity mode. And uh, in principle, the quantum dot can emit a photon at its own uh, intrinsic frequency, but also at some different frequencies by emitting or absorbing an acoustic phonon. When you put the quantum dot in the cavity, you actually, you actually accelerate the spontaneous emission of the zero phonon line, the intrinsic transition of the quantum dot. And you don't do that for the phonon sideband. So in the end, you, you um, drastically improve the ratio of light emitted in the useful transition and you drastically re uh, reduce, like you can see here, orders of magnitude, the probability of emitting in the phonon sideband. So when we gathered all these ingredients, in 2016, we managed to have extremely high quantum purity of the single photons. We could obtain uh, in this Hongo model interference where we send two photons emitted by the same source, so successively emitted by the same source, that if they are in a pure quantum state should exit together on either uh, side of the beam splitter, you should never get a double click here. And actually it's what we see here. We had absolutely uh, no count beyond the noise showing that we could reach very high indistinguishability for the single photons. So I'm showing here result that we obtained in my group, but as a community, we have moved uh, very much forward in this, uh, in this uh, area. Uh, and I'm showing here some kind of uh, um, picture of where we are right now. So uh, if you want to know all the details about these progresses on the single photon source, you can have a look at this uh, nice review paper that uh, Glenn, uh, Andrew uh, and I wrote in 2017, basically, what happened is that if you make a map of the source performance in distinguishability on the x-axis, where you want to have 100% here, efficiency or brightness in the vertical axis, and this is a log scale. Parodic down conversion sources, if, you're, if they are not multiplexed, are stuck here, very high in distinguishability, but you cannot go to high brightness. The quantum dot source technology in the years 2013 and 2015, we could get high brightness, at limited indistinguishability or high indistinguishability at in, uh, limited brightness. And since 2016, we have been able to go up this path here, having very high indistinguishability and brightness. So in 2016, we were around 20 to 30%. And I'm indicating here the last point here uh, where we are now uh, in 2020, 21, we managed to reach above 50% efficiency, still keeping very high indistinguishability. So Pascal? This, yes. 
Uh, this is Bill. Uh, maybe I can uh, ask a question. The sure. the indistinguishability numbers that you're giving us are for uh, essentially successive photons emitted by the same quantum dot. Yes. Now, some people would like to sure. have two quantum dots uh, emit um, uh, indistinguishable photons. What's the best you can do with that? I was going to come to that at the end. Ah, um, sorry. So, <laughs> uh, the state of the art right now, I think, is that if you don't have the source in the cavity, uh, Richard Warburton just last week presented in the conference that they got above 92% for two sources. But the sources no are not... Sorry? Without a cavity. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, but it's not bright. So it's without a cavity. It's a bit easier because there is no etching, no all that stuff that you need to do when you have a cavity. So it's uh, so without a bright source, this is a record, 90, 92%, I think. And on our side, we have 70% for two bright sources, but we know where the noise is coming from and we are working on it. So I think it's coming. Okay. Uh, it's coming. Thanks. Welcome. So even with a source, just a single source, um, this 10 time increase means that more than 10 time increase in efficiency means that if you want n photons, you basically have an exponential gain, 10 to the power of n. And actually, this is what has been uh, already uh, exploited to do boson sampling. So we gave a source to Andrew Wright a few years ago, and they did a three photon boson sampling and could show a 100 uh, speed up of the uh, three photon boson sampling. The group of Chai Gong the same year, did a five boson sampling that they could do a million times faster than what they had in, with SPDC sources. And when Google uh, published the quantum supremacy paper, they could do a 20 photon boson sampling with the same technology. So again, it's, um, it's coming. Um, but as, you, I will, as I will explain later, we have um, still a long route uh, ahead to make all this more scalable. So what I want to discuss, so I should say here, I, I, I removed the slide, but I, I want to mention it. All this was done in the group of Shai in, uh, and this is amazing. The, what they're doing is just amazing. Uh, but you see it's bulky, it's really bulk optics, right? So, um, and they have infinite means to do all that. So what we've been doing on our side is uh, working to integrate our sources with chips. So we have some results about that with uh, the group of Fabius Carino, I will not discuss that. I wanted to discuss something a bit different. First, that we've been doing with our sources as they are. So they generate single photons indistinguishable, they are, that are indistinguishable uh, one after the other. And with that, we have uh, worked to produce this other state of light that we would like to have uh, for many applications, so linear cluster states. So we've done that. Uh, one of the motivation I mentioned it before is that to scale optical quantum computing, but also maybe for uh, quantum repeaters, we would like to have cluster state of light, this light state where you have many photons that are entangled together. Uh, with SPDC sources, there have been a lot of progress in this direction as well. So if you want to do a four photon cluster state, you can use two SPDC sources. If you want six, you need three. Uh, the record, I think, is still back 2018. Again, the group of Chai Yang Lu and Chan Wei Pan, 12 photons using six sources. You see here that um, this kind of stuff don't scale very well. Uh, it's extremely demanding on the resource side, and it's based on linear optics uh, in many ways. So actually, the scalability of this approach is not uh, fantastic. Um, we know how to do it better uh, on paper uh, using spin photon entanglement. So this was a, a theoretical proposal by um, uh, Linder and Rudolph, 2009, where the idea is basically with our system, it would mean that you have a spin in a quantum dot and you have, because of the optical selection rules, you can pump the quantum dot and it will emit a photon that is entangled with a spin. And you can do that repeatedly to generate linear cluster state. So there was a first proof of principle in the group of um, David Gershoni a few years ago. And we are working on, on this approach right now in my lab. Uh, you basically need to do that in a cavity to make to go beyond the three photons that was done in this paper. Uh, and it's not easy. Uh, but there is actually something intermediate, which I think is quite elegant, which was proposed by Agai Eisenberg. It's something a bit intermediate, 
where you um, basically replace the spin by a gate plus a delay loop, which is uh, kind of a memory, and you still use linear optical quantum uh, linear gates. But you can uh, really exploit the best of our sources here, where, which generate photons that are indistinguishable uh, one after the other. And you send them in um, a, a system, an entangling system, where here you have a gate, and the photon has a half, uh, uh, half probability to go into the loop or half to, go, uh, to continue. And if it goes into the loop, it will meet the next photon that comes and be entangled with it. So this is the sequential entangler that was proposed in this theory paper in 2017. And we decided to do it together. So um, the group of Agai built the setup and it fit, it fit in this uh, suitcase. Uh, this is uh, Daniel, Yehuda, and Agai joining us in Paris. So you can see the cathedral here. It was before it burnt. And uh, everything is in there. And we just plugged their setup, which was basically a rack size press electronic system to our uh, single photon source, which is in the cryostat. So we generate the four laser pulses, which uh, leads to four uh, photons that will enter this uh, entangling system, which is very simple. And it's thought uh, so, so as to be as simple as possible, where you have basically four polarization controllers, a polarizing beam splitter, which behaves like a gate. And this um, delay loop here, which just gives you some kind of uh, memory. And uh, at the output of this uh, PBS here, you have your linear cluster state, uh, provided that you do post selection here on the detectors. And you, by adding this other PBS here, you can also analyze the state here. So basically, if, if we want to translate what I've just tried to explain with uh, my own words into a logic circuit, uh, we can describe what we are doing for four photons as uh, is sketched here. Each photons undergo uh, an Adama gate, then a uh, non-tangly gate with the uh, next photons here. Then there is a phase gate in the loop, and uh, you have analysis at the end of the scheme for each photon here. And you can repeat that for four photons. So we did this uh, scheme for up to four photons, and I should say that this was done somewhere before and just after the moving. So it was quite uh, acrobatic measurements to do, but uh, the, we did our best. And we did uh, that with um, different sources of different qualities. So you can see here the results. So we do uh, we measure some uh, um, non-local interference for two, three, and four photons. And they have uh, derived some metrics that allows to uh, extract some degree of entanglement I will explain just after. And at the bottom, you can see the state that we generate. So we did it for uh, two photons with two sources with different indistinguishability, same for three photons and just one source for four photons here. So the scheme I just presented does not allow to do a full tomography of the states that is produced. So we don't have an S degree of freedom in the setup, but uh, we could still uh, extract uh, some entanglement witness. So we can extract some W here, which is, uh, uh, sorry, we extract this W, there is some symbol missing here, which is actually an upper bound for the real W of the state. Uh, which should be negative if there is entanglement for the three, two, and four photons. And we could see here that you can actually uh, demonstrate entanglement up to four photons uh, with two standard deviation here. So what is nice with this uh, approach is um, that it's a method that is extremely nice in terms of scaling ratio. The scaling ratio, we can we introduce it to, to see how many, how many photons you are going to, to be able to go. So how many counts you lose uh, when you add one photons? So basically, uh, you can plot, we plot here the scaling ratio as a function of the visibility of the two photon interference. And the blue line here, no, sorry, the red dotted line here is the upper limit of the scaling ratio, which will be a factor of two because we still use a probabilistic gate. We don't have a deterministic gate. We have a 50% of the gate, probability that the gate will do what we want it to do. So this is the upper limit. But if you use a, a parametric down conversion source, you have um, the, an intrinsic relation between the two source, the two photon visibility, indistinguishability, like I mentioned before, and the source efficiency. So you can only have a, a very bad uh, source efficiency at high indistinguishability, which means that the scaling ratio drops dramatically here. And you have this kind of curve that comes when you just look into the detail of what happens. 
So the blue spots are what has been what has been done uh, previously. The scheme, the same scheme with the parenting down conversion source here, and this is what you would get if you would take the best SPDC source. And this is what we have obtained just with our imperfect source uh, in this first demonstration. So we already beat the limit of what you can do with uh, the best uh, parameter down conversion sources. So we will soon try to go to a higher number of photons. And we also can think of doing more than 1D cluster state by changing a little bit the apparatus. So you see here that uh, we still want the deterministic source. We have nice sources, but they are still at best. 20, 30% efficient, and we want to go uh, toward the ideal cells here at the upper right corner. So this is what the, I would say that the, this is the race that is now on in our community. People are working harder and harder to make the source more efficient. And uh, to explain what's, what challenge it is, I want to go a little bit into more details here. So I already mentioned that we want, uh, we put the quantum dot in the cavity. And so we have this beta probability that the quantum dot emits into the cavity, eta top to probability that the photon escapes through the top of the, the cavity and you can collect them. There is then the occupancy of the quantum dot transition. You really want to bring the quantum dot in its excited state. And if you want everything to be close to one, this number should be one as well. And then for all applications we want a photon with a well-defined polarization. So we want also a polarization degree as close as one, as close to one as possible. Um, this is just to get the photon out of the semiconductor, okay? And this is where the main difficulty lies. And then there is another difficulty, which is to make an efficient setup to have this sent to an optical fiber. So then you have an, another parameter, which is just how good you are at making a transmittive setup, which is very hard to, but less physics in it, well, more optics in it. So there were some limitations in the schemes that we are using. And one of the main limitations is that we want to do resonant excitation. We want to do coherent control of our two-level system, and we are doing that on a micron-sized um, device. So the way it's been done is that we excite with one polarization, and we get rid of the laser, which is exactly at the same frequency as our single photon, which is, of course, a real problem, by uh, removing the laser in a cross polarization scheme. So it works only if your dots, your dot rotates the polarization. So it works because we use this kind of transition. So a little bit of solid state physics here. If you have a, a hole, for instance, in the quantum dots, you have a different optical transition between the ground and excited states. And actually, depending on the spin states, it will emit or uh, absorb light in right polarization if the spin is up, or left polarization if the spin is down. So this is uh, using the circular basis. I can rewrite this in linear basis. And now I have four transition, which means that I can actually, you see this is very nice because I have a four level system. I can excite in V and collect in H, and I will have always photon in cross polarization. So this is what has been exploited, but there is a big problem here is that the polarization degree of the source. The source is by itself unpolarized, and we remove half of the brightness of the source. So we will never get to the deterministic um, source just doing like this. And there are different ways of solving the problem. So the first way of solving the problem has been proposed by Glenn uh, by separating spatially the excitation from the collection. So you can use a waveguide, excite from the side, and the waveguide will guide the light through your macro pillar and you can collect here on the top. And you see there is a big distance and you can really separate spatially and you don't need to remove the polarization. And now you have access to all polarization. So that's one way of doing it. The other way that has been uh, uh, proposed is to use the polarized crystal effect. You take a cavity that has birefringence, so it has different um, it has a polarization splitting in, for its mode, and you put your emitter resonant with one of the cavity modes. So basically, you engineer a uh, uh, polarized per cell effect. It will emit faster in this mode than in the other polarization. And this was proposed by, again, the group of Chai Yong Yu using uh, elliptical pillars, and they managed to go from 30% to 60% brightness, cross lens brightness. And the same idea was implemented by. Uh, Richard Warburton with an open cavity structure, and they did even better because it's not the first lens brightness, it's a fibroid brightness at now 
So we proposed another, a third, uh, a third solution. And I actually, I like this third solution because it goes back to solid state physics and it exploits all what we think of uh, detrimental in our system. Basically some asymmetries that we want to get rid of normally and acoustic phonons. So the idea is that when you take a quantum dot that has no charge, just a neutral quantum dot, the energy structure of our system is very different. Basically, there is some kind of uh, symmetry reduction. You end up with some uh, states for your system, which are actually linearly polarized. So if you do nothing, if you take the average quantum dot you can find in your sample, it has a fully uh, linear dipole uh, in terms of optical transition. So you have a naturally polarized single photon source. The problem is that it's very difficult to excite this state. Uh, you cannot just do resonant excitation because basically if you collect X, if you excite X, it will emit only in X polarization. So what we've done is to use what we, uh, uh, what is called the funnel assisted excitation. And we explain just after what it is, but you just detune the laser on the blue side and now you can excite one polarization and collect in both polarization. And what I see, I show here is the single photon um, spectrum as a function of um, wavelength for exciting X collecting X or Y. And you see that we have a very high degree of polarization. Basically you have 99% linear polarization degree, which is just coming from the natural symmetry, asymmetry of the quantum dot. Now you may wonder how efficient is this kind of excitation scheme? Because if you are in an atomic physics system, when you detune the laser, there is no way that you can bring your emitter in a excited state very, with very high probability. It's completely different in the solid state. And I think it's actually a beautiful work that was published in various theory papers in the, between 2013 and actually last year. The idea is that you will uh, use phonon assisted excitation. So what it is, what is it is that you have your two level system ground and excited state, And if you just uh, go into a new, sorry, you set, you set your laser here uh, slightly blue. And when you go into the rotated frame, you basically end up with your two uh, dress states, sorry, two states, uh, which are split by the detuning between the laser and your transition. And then you switch on the laser and you will have uh, dressing of the state. So because of the laser intensity, you split these two states even more. And what happens is that when you split these two states even more, you end up in a um, energy separation of the two states where phonon emission is very efficient. So basically what happens over time is that you start with your two states here, your, your quantum dot is in the ground state, and then you switch on the laser. So you, you have your states which are dressed by the are repulsed by the uh, addressing with the electromagnetic field. And during this period here, you have phonon emission. So you go from this state to this state, which uh, at the end of the pulse means that you brought your quantum dot into the excited state. So what's very important in this scheme is how you turn off, sorry, how you turn on and off your laser. But basically you have only phonon assisted phenomena during the pulse duration. So it doesn't degrade, um, the, um, the jitter of the creation process because phonons only play a role during the pulse, which is always, in, in any case, the, the uncertainty you have in terms of creation of your uh, excited state. So what was so this was shown in 2013. Uh, it could it was shown that if you look at the population of the excited state, if you go to resonant excitation, you have this uh, well-known Rabi oscillation where uh, you have a rapid oscillation of your um, population. And if you go to phonon assisted excitation, you end up with this red curve and you can have actually very high occupancy, even for a detuning, which is a thousand times more than the line width of your state. What was demonstrated uh, just in 2019 is that you actually can get even very high indistinguishability using, using this scheme, uh, indistinguishability uh, around one, uh, despite the use of phonon tubing. Uh, the excitation. So this is what we explored. So we first studied the occupancy we can get. So we basically just did exactly this study here. We use a quantum dot and we compare the occupation we can get using resonant excitation and phonon assisted excitation. This is the pulse area and you see that we were, uh, we were able to reach 80% occupancy uh, as compared to resonant excitation. And this is still, I think, 
possible to improve much more than that, shaping better the laser and stuff like that. Um, then we can compare, yes? Sorry, can I ask a question? Sure. About this excitation pr process. So um, can I think of this as sort of a Raman transition, but that it's so close detuned that the, that the stark shifts on the levels are important. And so it's sort of, it's only resonant when the, you know, turning on the first drive essentially shifts the Raman resonance condition. And then I guess there's a, yeah, I think, it's, like uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's that it, what, what drives, what control the efficiency of your process here is um, the typical energy scale over which your quantum dot couples to phonon. And this is very dependent on the quantum dot shape. So for each quantum dot, you may need to go a bit closer or larger detuning or a bit stronger pulse or stuff like that. Um, but I think, yes, I think what you just described is exactly what it is. Okay, so it's basically that with the extra ingredient that the phonon coupling has frequency dependence. So there's a specific splitting at which this works well. It's it's smooth. I mean, it's not a very sharp stuff, right? But uh, mm -hmm. but all it all depends on what you want. Uh, sorry, to get if you want to go as close as possible to one hundred percent occupancy. Uh, clearly you need to take that into account and the power and this is the spectral density of the phonon coupling here mm -hmm. on this graph, okay? So, yeah. Excellent, thank you. To, to follow up on that, does, does this process depend on uh, the presence of thermal photons or phonons? Does it go away when the sample is cold? Yeah, so you're right. I should have commented on that. Mm. Actually, it's the opposite. It's um, it's a phonon emission, so you don't need to absorb phonon. It's not absorption. Okay. So actually, the maximum occupancy you get uh, gets better when you cool down more. So actually, in my measurements, the fact that my microstat doesn't go below 8K is one of the limitations. Calculations show that you can go to higher occupation when you go to 2 Kelvin, for instance. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so here I'm going to compare the same source um, operated under resonant excitation and phonon assisted excitation. And on the left, you see the, the brightness of the source. So this was a source which was uh, not, not based on a trion, but based on an excitant. So the brightness was like something 15%. And immediately when we go to, we go to phonon assisted excitation, we more than double the efficiency of our source. If we look at the G2, of the source, um, you see that when you do to resonant excitation, there is a slight increase of G2 when you pump harder. Whereas when you do funnel assisted excitation, actually you have similar G2s in the end, but it tends to reduce a little bit. And it's actually theoretically predicted. And actually what I'm showing you here is clearly not optimal. We need to work on the way we shape our laser and we should be able to do much better than that. But at, at least it's as good as resonant excitation in terms of G2. Now we can play with all the parameters, play with the detuning of the laser with respect to the dot, the pulse duration, and we can look at the G2, the indistinguishability, which is basically independent of everything, and the brightness. And you see here that uh, the closer we are for our quantum dots, uh, the more the brighter the source gets, and we were here above 50% uh, brightness for um, a device which was only 15% uh, before and actually cannot be beyond 60% um, efficiency uh, with our te current technology. So we were quite happy with that. The, the cherry on the cake for us is that, well, there are lots of interesting features uh, to this scheme. Um, the first one, and uh, as Glenn mentioned, we are working with Condela who is commercializing the sources. This scheme is extremely easy to implement. There is no comparison. It's extremely easy to operate and extremely robust to drift. You see that uh, it's very flat, the power dependence and the tuning dependence. So if you're, there is any change of detuning between your dot and your laser, because it, either the dot or the laser has an unstable frequency, the intensity of the source doesn't change. And it's very, very nice. The other thing that we like very much is that it's compatible with spin photon entanglement that we want to use to do this cluster state. Basically, when I describe these optical selection rules between the spin 
um, states and the polarization of the light. This is basically at the core of the spin photon entanglement that we want to use to generate cluster state. And when you are using a scheme that remove one of the polarization, you cannot play with these optical selection rules anymore. So actually with our scheme, with phonon assisted excitation, we can because we just use spectral filtering and we don't do uh, polarization filtering. And actually we are currently playing with these kind of schemes to try to create uh, untangled, spin mediated photon photon entanglement. I don't know how long I've been so far. Um, well, I've been very long. Um, I wanted to tell you more. Um, about, but you asked questions, so, <laughs> so maybe I have another 10 minutes. Yeah, I, I think another 10 minutes or so is good. Okay, I'm gonna stop at some point. Um, I wanted to discuss a bit um, what we've done because I've talked a lot about technology, but we have also been a lot of um, fundamental physics with our system, uh, one we, want, we were not expecting to do. Uh, basically our system is good enough to do some textbook atomic physics and we have revisited a little bit spontaneous emission. So what I mean by that is that um, when we do coherent control, like I mentioned before, we create quantum superposition of ground and excited state of an atom. And it was unclear, although uh, on paper it seemed clear, although it's not so easy to, to describe, uh, we were wondering whether we can transfer this atomic coherence to the light field. Can we create a quantum superposition of vacuum and one photon based on the quantum superposition of crown and excited state of the atom. So this is a question that we wanted to ad we addressed in our system. I, I shouldn't say wanted because we, we, we somehow found it by, uh, by mistake. Uh, but we basically just uh, tested that. And uh, to do that, we, what we did is that we create two photon states in our uh, system. So we, sorry, we operate not at pipers when we know that we don't create for sure the excited state, but the atom is in the superposition of ground excited state. And we take the generated photons and we send them on the beam, sp uh, beam speeder to do a Hongo model interference, just taking the first photon, delaying it so that it arrives at the same time as the second photon. And we have a phase between the two arms of this interferometer and uh, we are solid state physicists, we don't stabilize the phase. So it's gonna be freely evolving, but we, are, uh, we have enough signals so that we can monitor uh, the evolution of the phase. What we're doing uh, in this experiment is that we are revisiting the Hongo Mandel interference with not photon, uh, one photon Fox state, but the superposition of zero plus one. So here I, I, I write pure quantum superposition of zero and one photon. And then the output state is a bit more complicated than the one we get when we just consider the one photon part. So when we take just the one photon part, we have this two zero minus zero two at the output of the beam splitter. But now that I have also vacuum in the pure quantum superposition, I have also zero zero and one one state. So I'm not interested in these uh, two photon coincidences that we normally do to measure the mean wave packet of the lap of the photon. I'm going to be interested in this uh, single photon events here, which are dependent on the relative phase between the two arms of the beam splitter. And actually what we can see here is that uh, if I have a superposition of uh, zero and one photon, the single count at the output of the beam splitter, they should vary as a function of the phase phi uh, with um, visibility that is proportional to the vacuum part of my state. So as the more vacuum there is, the more visibility I will have and they should oscillate in opposite phase. So when we, this was for a pure state, if I now consider a, a mixed state, uh, we can show that actually this single counts at the output of the beam splitter, they should vary with the phase, with the visibility, which is basically given by the purity in the photon number basis, the purity in the frequency domain and the vacuum population. So it means that if I see oscillation at the output of my um, HOM, um, it means that I have both purity in the frequency domain, which we already know because we have uh, highly distinguishable photons, but also purity in the photon number basis. So this is actually what we observed and we had to explain. Uh, if we cite around pi over two, this is what we see on our detectors. We have no stabilization of the phase. It evolves slowly in time. And here you see that there is this opposite phase uh, evolution of the two detector counts. And we can extract from that some visibility, as I mentioned before. And you can do that for different excitation power where we create more vacuum on more uh, excited state of the atom. And we can actually 
map completely the, indis the visibility of our uh, oscillations uh, to the, the formula I gave before. And we could show that we have actually a very nice purity in the photon number basis. So we do create pure quantum superposition of zero and one photon. I wanted to discuss that because recently we've been a bit one step further in playing with spontaneous emission. We've, I, I will just introduce, not enter into the details, we, we've created photon number entanglement using the entanglement that takes place when you have spontaneous emission. So the idea is that you start with the pipers and you bring your atoms. This time I go to the pipers. I bring the atom is inside its states and there is a spontaneous emission decay time T1 here. So over time, my state evolves between the quantum dot in its excited state and the quantum dot in the ground state with one photon with this kind of uh, evolution here. See, if I stop at the special times, uh, delta T, which is uh, uh, logarithmic of two T1, I end up in a situation where my light matter state is in the, the entangled state where the dot is in excited state with no photon emitted, or the dot in the ground state and one photon has been emitted. So for the light field, there is no intensity emitted in the first place, or one photon has been emitted in the first half of the uh, first period I'm considering. And if I let the system evolve, until the end, I will, I will have a photon released for sure. And I can just in my mind for now, uh, split the life wave packet into two bins, early or late emission. So it's just for now, uh, um, just a vision of a theoretical vision that I can, in I excite my atom, it can emit a photon early or late. And if I encode the information on the fact that I have a photon in the early or late time bit, actually, I. I could, I could say that this is a psi plus state, zero and one plus one zero, one photon emitted late or one photon emitted early. It's not very interesting uh, with just one pulse, but if you go to two pulses, so I stop here and at this instant, I do a second pi pulse and the uh, quantum dot which was in its excited state and had not emitted a photon now is brought back to the ground state and it will not emit a photon. And the situation where the quantum dot was in the ground state and had emitting the photon will be re-excited. So you see here is that because I, I make a second pi pulse when the atom and the light are already are still entangled, at the end of the spontaneous emission process, this first part of the state gives me no photon and the second part of the state gives me two photons, one emitted early, one emitted late. So basically we have just found, uh, we are just to come up with a scheme that allows to create photon number entanglement. So you can see that as with two pulses, I can now create this phi plus state, zero, zero plus one, one. So I uh, will not enter into the details. Actually, it's a work we are still finalizing with uh, Carlos Anton and Stephen Ryan and in collaboration with Christoph Simo, but we could do this measurement with two photons and actually two pulses, sorry, two pulses. And you see that you actually you can repeat that with many pi pulses as you want. You can create weird states of light depending on the delay and stuff like that. And we could show actually, we could analyze doing correlation measurements, the population of the state and as well as the fidelity to the Bell state that I was presenting before. And with that, I'm going to just uh, some additional perspectives and some work which actually goes into uh, in the line of some uh, questions that uh, Bill asked before. So I didn't present it, but uh, so we had no clean room for two years and a half, but we had many samples fabricated in advance. So we did some kind of benchmarking of our technology with what we had, and we could test the, how reproducible were our performances. So we could find that basically 25% of the sources were showing a brightness about 5% in the distinguishability in the 90% range. And we are now working in this remote source interference. And we also learned a lot here on what's limiting uh, in our uh, technology. So we are now making the next batch of samples. Um, I wanted also to mention that we have uh, worked on the what's, um, how the non wanted extra photon that we always get when we want a single photon source. The, the fact that the G2 is never zero means that there is a tiny probability of having an extra photon. We investigated how this, the nature of these extra photons influences the quantum interference. And if the noise is 
indistinguishable or distinguishable from the main photons, you have very different effects. So this is what we actually, um, there is a new formalism which was developed uh, by, uh, again, the group of Christoph Simons, and we have experimentally tested it. And uh, in terms of what we are uh, aiming to or what we are doing right now, um, one of the stuff I wanted to mention, uh, this superposition of zero plus one photon, uh, well, we proposed it as a new qubit. Uh, and so there are some theoretical study to see uh, what, uh, if this new kind of uh, state could be used to do boson sampling and be more difficult to maybe find a scheme to do a, a quantum computational advantage with fewer photons. So this is the theory work of uh, Jean-Marie Anima, and he called that superposition boson sampling. So we will try to implement that. And we are working also on, um, we are using our uh, atomic system to explore quantum thermodynamics based on this work by, uh, written by Alexia Fame last year. So, uh, we have, we are, well, we should have some stuff around that too. And with that, I want to thank the wonderful team I have the chance to work with. Um, many of them have played a very important role in all this. So um, uh, I've been working for a long time now with Roy Clanco, Olivier Krebs, Aristide Lemaitre, uh, Isabelle Sain, who are uh, helping us fabricating the sample. And uh, these are our spin experts. Uh, the Quandela founders, Valerie Angis and Nicolo Somaski, they left four years, five, four years ago, and we are still working together very closely. And all the students uh, involved in the work I presented today. So uh, Hélène Olivier, Sarah Thomas, Marie Billard, Thierry Moncro, Clément Millet, Ilse Mayette, uh, who is working on the quantum thermodynamics, uh, Elam uh, Mehdi, Nathan Cost, Mathias Pons, uh, Stephen Vine. Uh, Carlos Santon and Juan Loredo. Uh, and we have also a, a blooming activity on uh, playing even more with finance, uh, led by Daniel Kimura, uh, with Martin Esman, Omar Ortiz, Anne Rodriguez, and Priya. And I thank you for your attention and your questions. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Um, so the floor is now open for questions. Should I switch off the sharing mode or so screen sharing? Um, usually the first couple of questions we get are sort of about the actual slides. Okay. And so then let's see. Bill, you must have some more. Of sure. course, but I was trying to give other people a chance. <laughs> <laughs> I could ask a question, Alicia. This is Glenn. Uh, Perfect. When you were talking about this linear cluster state, uh, is this useful on itself? I mean, I've, I've heard that you have to you have to make a multi-dimensional cluster state out of this, like a two D cluster state. I don't yeah. know much about it, but but is there some scheme to take that linear cluster state and knit it together? Yeah, so there are many schemes. You're right. I mean, we need more than linear cluster state. I mean, one step at a time, but. Um, it's true that we need more than that. And actually, um, um, using the scheme of uh, Agai, uh, when we, what we have here uh, in the loop uh, could be modified to have, here it's a passive element. And uh, Agai, is, I know, has ideas to make it active and change depending on the photons that come in, comes in. And uh, with that, uh, he has some ideas on how to make 2D cluster states. So, I cannot tell you more than that, but he knows how to do it. Do, do, do you think the linear cluster state on its own is useful for something? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Uh -huh. But I'm not an expert in that. Okay. Thanks. Well, maybe I can ask one. So I was wondering how how crazy would it be to like drive the the cavities from the back because you know, you, you have a fabric Perot, which is intrinsically two-sided. Yeah, but uh -huh. yeah, but we make it as single-sided as we can because we want all the photon to go through the top. You know, but in some sense, like uh, the lasers are sure, way sure, sure. too powerful. So sure, sure, sure. So actually what you're saying uh, is done by um, Wolfgang Loeffler. He's done that in his system in uh, Leiden. Um, yeah, it works. <laughs> you can stick a, lay, a, a fiber at the bottom, stick a fiber at the top, he's done that, and you're done. 
uh, it doesn't, um, yeah, it doesn't remove the problem of the polarization, right? Um, we still need to get rid of the laser because it, if it comes in, it comes out, um, ah. right? Yes. I'm used to driving the qubits, which are not on resonance with the cavity. And so then it, it does exactly the filtration that I would want. But that you Yeah, so this is what you are doing with the phonon excitation, actually. You are detuned and it works. But in terms of integration, this is cool. It's but you, you could do this with your uh, off resonant pumping though. Right? Yeah, <laughs> you know, I don't like having two fibers on each side. I think it's very painful <laughs> in terms of handling, but uh, maybe we will go into this direction. But there is also the cooling problem. You want to be sure that you cool properly, right? So when you don't have a gas exchange in your cryostat is more demanding, I 